Well, it's my pleasure to be here again. We've been doing this for many years, but nothing tells us uh, how relevant it is to your own practices than to see such great attendance today. So thank you very much for coming to our, to our conference. We really appreciate it. Um, at uh, tab eight of the materials that you have there, you'll find a hard copy of a PowerPoint presentation that we're presenting on today. It's uh, entitled Technology the Digital and the Digital World Opportunities and Challenges. It's a very wide-ranging topic, but uh, technology is the focus today. Um, I have the privilege to be uh, sharing this uh, event and uh, speaking with the, the members of the panel who consist of Anne-Marie Batalan, and we also have Lynn Harford and Jessica Schroeder. Um, technology being the theme uh, of today's conference, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't know something about each of their digital personalities. So I thought it would be important for me on a full disclosure basis to, to share some of that information with you. Um, but before I get to that, uh, Anne-Marie, now that I've got you nervous, I, I want to commend you for your many years at Holland Blairview Hospital in the service of uh, helping children with um, adolescent, uh, children and adolescents with acquired brain injury to, to recover function and to move on with their lives. Um, uh, personally, Anna, Anna Marie is excited this uh, fall because her stepson is getting married. Um, so that's wonderful to hear. And uh, just on the due diligence front, when I Googled Anne Marie's um, name, I was a bit distressed because the Anna Marie I know is quite different from the the information that I got on the net, the, frankly, the only notable um, information I found that Anna Marie Batalan is a top, top listed cute baby name, actually. If you Google that, you'll find Anna Marie is a very top cute baby name. So <laughs> nothing too much to worry about there, Anna Marie. Well, when it came to Lynn Harford, it was a bit of a different story. Um, but uh, before I, I share with you uh, a bit about Lynn's digital personality, again, I've known Lynn uh, professionally for many years. Um, Lynn has uh, done great service to the pediatric and um, adolescent acquired brain injury community and their family beginning at Sick Kids um, some, some years ago. Um, Lynn gets younger, and so do all my panelists every time I see them, so I, I don't think mention of years is, is really that illustrative. Um, Lynn went on to become a member of the Social Work Consulting Group, where she practices today, and continues to be very vibrantly in pursuit of new qualification and uh, new ways to help her community, um, graduating from the Vancouver Art Therapy Institute with an advanced diploma in, in art therapy recently. Um, just in terms of uh, personal details, Lynn did share with me, um, I asked for full disclosure, so Lynn uh, knew how to interpret that and so advises me that I can tell you that she has bought a horse. She has. <laughs> and um, carrying on with the agricultural uh, nature of uh, Lynn's pursuits, um, when I googled Lynn I found too much information so I figured as a, as a, a lawyer I should dig a bit deeper um, and get into some nuanced uh, news about Lynn so I could share that with you and I hope you take what I found as a good filter to consider what she's saying today. I found a picture of Lynn with a John Deere farm tractor. <laughs> so uh, not too bad, and yes. that's all right. I'm just yes. keeping it clean. There, that's good. Jessica as well um, has um, worked in the uh, brain injury field for many years um, as a practicing social worker at Toronto Rehab. Um, and she continues to endeavor beyond her, her activities at work to assist in, in many different ways. She has, um, she has um, at least um, had been, been preserved for time immemorial as a panelist on a YouTube video which is Best Practices for Hospital Social Workers in Transitional Care in November of 2013. Lots of hits on that, I'm sure. Big hits, big hits. <laughs> I saved that as a favorite, actually. <laughs> and uh, there's um, 
news uh, personally about Jessica as well in that it's the point where she's uh, uh, going to enjoy a transition and her own professional responsibilities joining the social work consulting group uh, up and coming uh, and we have a number of members from that group here today so welcome all and congratulations on securing a, a wonderful uh, professional to assist you in your, your future endeavors. Without further ado, um, and with a little bit of mystery um, that Lynn will soon help out with, we'll proceed to our presentation at this time. And I just, um, because of my own technological issues, want to confirm that this little box here doesn't blow anything up, but in fact can be helpfully used to, uh, to change <laughs> slides. Is, is that fair? The green, big green button, okay. There we are, okay. With you, Lynn. Good afternoon, everyone. I think it's kind of getting around nap time, so I hope everyone can uh, hang in there. Um, so when we were sort of thinking about preparing for this presentation today, I just kind of want to tell a little bit of a story about how we got here. For those of you who might be asking how does social work and technology go together, trust me, I'm asking myself the same question. Um, Probably last fall, actually, David had approached myself and my colleagues to participate in the Back to School Conference. And at that time, he said uh, the theme for the conference this year is going to be about supporting families in the aftermath of ABI and trauma. And I said, right, that's right up my alley. I'm there. I'm on board. Let's go for it. And so as the months went by and, you know, we got through the spring and summer's approaching and September's right around the corner, uh, David called us up and said, okay, it's time to start preparing for this conference today. And uh, just one little thing I need to share is that the conference theme has actually changed. Uh, and now we're talking about technology. Uh, I think there was a very, very big silence on the phone on the part of all of us about what do we potentially have to offer uh, the community about technology. When I think about that, I really think about my OT colleagues who are really well versed in this field. So. Um, we actually had a really great discussion, and uh, through that process, we, we kind of came to a place where we said, yeah, you know what, I think we do have something to offer. And so I think our main goal here today is really to um, plant some seeds about this idea of technology. And, and I think when we're talking about technology, it's not necessarily about what we're using, but really about this social, digital world that's around all of us now, and how the, the clients that we're working with are interfacing with that technology every day. So I encourage you to really think about your own practice, what you're doing with your clients, and perhaps even what you're doing in your own personal life as we move through this presentation today. So to think about where we are, it's always important to look at where we have been. And so I've, I've put up a few pictures. I think the art therapist in me needed a little bit of a visual representation of things. Um, I think the boom box probably goes with Dee's comment earlier, um, probably something from the 80s. Um, certainly when I was a student, I was uh, needing to go to the library to actually open up a book and go to the card catalog and figure out where that book is on the shelf, go and get it, and if you were like me, I spent a lot of money in photocopying and quickly ran home. Um, the telephone certainly has changed over the years. I think as I, when I was a teenager, the biggest uh, thing that we had going on in our house was asking my dad if I could have a call waiting line, and he's like, not a chance. Like, if I'm on the phone, I'm on the phone. So, you know, things have really changed in, in the world of technology. So where are we today? We are very much in an online world. Um, our kids are, are using the computer every day. Um, Google, Facebook uh, is out there, and um, it, is, it is a very different world, certainly, from when many of us uh, were young people. So what are we going to cover today? We're going to look a little bit at a review of the statistics, so more importantly, looking at how are our youth and adolescents um, interfacing with uh, online worlds. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, what are the opportunities and challenges when we're working with kids with ABI? And my colleague, Anna Maria, is going to bring some of her clinical expertise to that discussion. We're then going to look a little bit at um, cyber counseling and online supports. Um, and then um, I'm going to come back up to the podium and, and talk a little bit more about the professional and ethical considerations that we uh, as professionals need to be thinking about in our daily practice out there in the community uh, when it comes to technology. 
And then um, before David sort of closes us off, I'm going to just provide a few statistics about cyberbullying, and then David's going to give us a, a summary of uh, the legal pieces around cyberbullying and what that really means. And then hopefully we'll have some time for some discussion that will allow uh, everybody here to bring some of their uh, clinical experiences to the table. Okay, so um, I got this information online, go figure. Um, so this uh, research study is called Young Canadians in a Wired World. It was a 2013 research study um, through MediaSmart, so it is a Canadian uh, research study. Uh, and this was um, um, actually a really great resource, and we have it listed a little bit further on in the presentation, so I would encourage people to check it out. There's lots of downloadable PDF, um, you know, how to talk to your kids about texting, being online, and all that kind of stuff. So the study focused on the internet behaviors and attitudes of 5,436 students, uh, and the students were in grades 4 to 11, and all provinces within Canada were represented. Um, all uh, English and French students were included, and the research was administered by teachers between the months of February to June 2013. So, um, in terms of online access, what did they find? 99% of students have access to the internet outside of school. And I think this has really changed in terms of, um, you know, where kids can get information. Um, they are using portable devices, and certainly they're used much more than desktop computers to access the internet, um, with cell phones and smartphones being the primary device used. And 39% uh, of students report sleeping with a cell phone so as not to miss calls or messages. And I think that cartoon also captures a little bit about kind of the relationships and how we're changing in terms of our communication um, with, with each other. Um, in terms of their online activities, what are they doing? Uh, students are using media to find and access information, so unlike me who had to go to the library, kids can do it anywhere um, and find information about everything. And I think this is also really interesting because I think a lot of the questions we m might have had as, as young people, you know, you kind of had them in your head and you had to think about, okay, can I actually go and ask my friend this question? This is a little bit sensitive. You know, nowadays, people just go on Google and type in anything they want and, and get answers on every topic out there. Um, the primary use uh, online is for entertainment and communicating with friends and family, so things like Facebook, YouTube. And many students in grades four to six have accounts on Facebook and Twitter, uh, despite user agreements that restrict children under the age of 13. So the top favorite sites um, for posting and sharing information, actually seven of the top sites um, are posting and sharing information sites. And uh, those top favorites being YouTube, Facebook, Google, and Twitter. Um, and that YouTube was rated number one um, by 75% of the students surveyed. So if we look at some of the gender differences in terms of online usage, 82% um, of girls agree with the statement, I could be hurt if I talk to someone I don't know online, compared to 63% of boys. And 51% of girls um, and 61% of boys view the internet as a safe place. So girls are a little bit more reserved in terms of uh, their safety online. Uh, girls have more household rules about online use and boys are more likely to engage in risky online behaviors. Um, and I think the last point was the one that really stood out for me, which is that parents actually have fewer rules in place compared to 2005. So it really speaks to how um, the use of technology and access to information and being online has really creeped into what we consider to be normal. Um, you know, I think someone started out the day saying, you know, we can't tell people to turn off their phones. I mean, I, I, I would challenge if there's anybody in here who doesn't have a cell phone on them. No. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Okay, so now I'm going to just pass it over to Anna Marie, who's going to talk a little bit more about some of the opportunities and challenges. Thank you, Lynn. I think Lynn really put a nice frame on um, our topic today and looking at how is how are young people using the technology and how is this being uh, seen as both an opportunity and a challenge 
So this slide here, we're talking about opportunities, and I think our focus of uh, most of the talks this morning, we're talking about how there's so many great things out there for young people um, who have an acquired brain injury and it can be quite helpful. So the executive functioning impairment uh, support, so often using agendas or their phone um, on iPads or iPhones on technology can be really helpful. Some of the cognitive retraining programs that were spoken about, uh, enhancing studying and learning skills with the use of adaptive programs, um, you know, the word cue, speech cue, read and write gold, all those kinds of programs that can be quite helpful. Um, I hear from my clients that I work with that um, it's really the way they stay in touch with their, their uh, friends. A lot of them don't actually meet face to face as much anymore. They see their friends at school, but outside of that, they're texting, they're Skyping, they're playing online games together, but not a lot of them are actually meeting up the same way probably uh, you and I did when, when we were in high school or when we were in middle school. Um, so it's really important to understand how critical this is for the young people to keep that kind of social connection. And I find even um, the clients I'm working with who are inpatients at our center, uh, most of them tell me, you know what, I can keep up with my friends, I can stay in touch with them because I'm Skyping with them in the evening or I'm, I am texting with them all the time. So for them, they're not feeling that same kind of isolation that a lot of the young people used to do when they would go into the rehab program and not have that connection with their friends. So there's lots of great opportunities out there. Um, when we look at the next slide, uh, we can talk a little bit about some of the challenges that can uh, we have to think about in the digital world. And I think Lynn was really pointing out to us that um, you know, there are a lot of fewer rules out there. There's uh, a lot of new evolving technology. I find I'm constantly working to uh, find out what's the newest thing that young people are engaging around because uh, I have to say it, it took me a while to really understand some of the texting uh, acronyms and some of those things as well. But to really engage with the young people, you really need to understand where they're coming from. But I hear that from the parents that I work with too, that there's a great big um, divide between what they know and what they understand and what their children know. Um, I was just um, interacting with a, a parent earlier the, in the week and she had a two-year-old with her and her two-year-old likes to play games on her phone and she's all of a sudden her phone started ringing with a, a phone, um, a ringtone that she didn't know and she's like, she does this all the time, she changes the ringtone, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> So it's, it's uh, amazing. The kids are really young and are learning how to do a lot of different things and their parents are having a hard time keeping up. And I almost look at it as this is a big divide and we need to have the parents understanding what's going on here. Um, and we're also, because technology is changing constantly too, it's becoming a much more portable society. We have a lot more, um, a lot more devices that are, you know, people are interacting on their phone. They're not using the big uh, laptop or desktop computer. Um, so we have to think about some of those things. Um, so what we know for young people is that impulsive, impulsivity can lead to poor choices in a digital world. Um, we know that the, they may not be stopping to think about what they're posting. And you think about what's the hot trend right now is taking selfies. Well, you know, posting a selfie in maybe not such appropriate clothing or in such an appropriate setting may not be so helpful because that you're leaving a digital record of yourself. Um, and as David was acknowledging, we all have a digital record, and I do encourage you to Google yourself and see what's up there on yourself. <laughs> um, so we really need to think about um, how do we educate young people and their families around uh, the, use of, the safe uh, use of the technology. Um, sometimes when we have the diminished face-to-face -face communication, um, it can result in frequent miscommunication. I think all of us have seen that those emails or texts where it's written in caps and, and oh my goodness, is someone yelling at me? Or you're trying to understand a text that someone sent you and what is the tone of voice that was put, put behind it? Because um, are they really upset with me? Is this just that they were texting this really quickly? So even for all of us, it can sometimes be hard to interpret what's, be, what's going on in the communication process. So if we think about our clients and families that we work with who have some um, often some challenges in those social communication roles, and as we were hearing about more um, difficulties in 
reading uh, tone of voice and understanding things, we really need to pay attention to, uh, to how people are communicating. Um, and I alluded to this before, the digital permanence has lasting effects. So even if they post something that's maybe not so appropriate and take it down, well, you know what? Someone else has already grabbed it and, and sent it on to their friends. And so they're, they're, it lives. I mean, we can all think of some of the uh, stories that were in the media recently about the teen suicides that have occurred around some of the, uh, the bullying that's been going on online. So we have to really, again, make that effort to under, for young people and their families to understand. Um, and sometimes that diminished social skills can lead to online victimization as well. So um, I, I find that often when I'm working with young people um, after an acquired brain injury, their friends, they don't have, they've lost a number of friends over the time period and they're pretty desperate for friends. And they're sometimes doing things that may not be so appropriate as far as, you know, trying to build friendships over that, the online presence. Uh, I have had, I worked with a young lady who, you know, was desperate for a boyfriend and she was posting things on Facebook that really weren't appropriate. Her family had no idea that she was doing this. It got to the point where she was actually starting to try to meet these people in person, and it was a really a big safety concern. Um, you know, family's first response is take away all the technology. Well, you know, you can't always put people in a bubble and not not uh, have them um, be able to 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 learn from the experience. So you have to find ways of helping them use that technology in a very safe way. So the next slide alludes to this. Um, it's really how do you talk to your clients about online behavior and safety? Um, you know, are, and this is for all of us therapists in the room, you know, are we doing this proactively or reactively? I know often it comes to me as, oh, this situation has already occurred and can you help us? Um, but I think we need to really think about the proactive side of things and really understand that when we're introducing maybe a young person to a phone with data that, uh, yes, it can be used to keep all your agenda items on it, but we also need to think about what you're, else you're doing on it. Um, we need to be aware of the developing child and the changes in their digital use over time and review the rules ongoing because, you know, right now maybe they're on, they're watching Treetop on, on the internet or they're on Netflix or seeing something on YouTube, but they're, they, as they're aging, they may be exploring different things and we need to go back and have that talk again with them. And I, this is a key one, and I already alluded to it, is being ahead of the child and teen, knowing what are the new apps and programs out there, and doing your research. And I, I hear this from families all the time. Well, my child is the techie one. They're the ones that fix the computer if it goes has a problem. They're the one that I go to if I'm, I'm stuck to putting together a PowerPoint, or they're the one I'm, I'm, uh, that, that knows things in and out. So, if you know that, then you also know that your child may be kind of hiding some information there too. And the, the, you know, it used to be that we would ask, you know, keep your desktop or laptop in a public space and let's have it so that, um, you know, you can keep an eye on what it is your child's doing. But now that we've got more mobile devices, you know, they're off on their phone somewhere and we're not necessarily always aware of what they're up to. So. It's important for us um, as both uh, therapists and parents to really be aware of what's going on in their lives and keeping that communication open. Um, so if we as therapists are introducing technology to a client, we have a professional obligation to ensure that the technology is being used safely and appropriately in consultation with the family members. And again, coming up with some real guidelines and rules and being a bit more concrete about it. We know that for our client population, when we can be clear and concrete and maybe even have something in writing, it can be helpful to for them as a reference as to, oh, I'm allowed to do this, I'm not allowed to do that, I can, this is what I agreed to, um, and having that conversation be revisited over time. The next slide um, actually is a really great resource we wanted to, to um, leave with you, and thank you, Lynn, for putting all this together. Um, there are some great sites out there that are really helpful for anyone who's working with um, someone on technology. Um, I, in particular, really like the Media Smarts, Canada Centre for Digital and Media Literacy, but there's, they, there's a lot of great tip sheets on there. There are a lot of good conversations on there. There are also things you may even want to sit 
down with your teenage population or even the adult population to say, okay, let's have a conversation about this. Let's use this as a learning opportunity. So have you ever had, a, had anyone you didn't know approach you online and what have you done? And let's talk about this and, and try to get some conversations going so that they know some strategies of how to deal with situations as they come up. So we wanted to make sure we included this as an um, uh, important piece. Uh, I'm going to pass it over. I know this is a very brief piece, and we'll probably come back to it in the question period, but I'm going to pass this over to Jessica to talk a bit more about cyber counseling and online supports. Great. Um, I realize we missed the opportunity to Google um, David, so maybe we'll have to do that afterwards and fill him in on what we <laughs> uncover there. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit, and it was actually a great um, kind of dovetailed well what uh, Dee and Mark shared about the use of some of the online technology to provide rehab from a distance. So cyber counseling certainly falls within the same, uh, the same category, basically um, having counseling support without the direct in-person contact. Um, so this can be done by email, by chat, uh, by video in, in real time, or voice. And uh, I'll talk in a little bit about some of the obvious uh, and maybe not so obvious pros and cons to cyber counseling in particular. Um, certainly, we've already heard today that technology has opened up new ways of accessing support. And uh, the, the numbers, of, um, particularly for Ontario, are interesting. And um, I often think in some of my work in the hospital, we have patients who do end up in more rural areas. So how are they able to access certain supports? Um, so um, a number of organizations are actually looking at providing online support, particularly through um, support groups, but that are basically offered um, online. So there's a number of different uh, organizations that offer this, um, and you can see some of them there. One in particular is um, based out of Australia. It's called Headspace, and um, I think it has a lot of great ideas that could be used uh, perhaps with some of our resources here in Canada, but it's geared towards um, adolescents, and it is basically offers chat room uh, opportunity for, for young people uh, recovering from brain injury to really connect and the model itself was, um, it was just very well done so I'd encourage you if you're interested to take a look at that um, and a number of other organizations as well. In terms of brain injury here, um, so I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with brainline.org. Um, it's a great website. It is a US-based website, so a lot of the statistics and numbers, they are, they are more specific really to the US population. But um, they offer a lot of great links to more of the individual stories that um, that are out there in terms of families, individuals recovering from brain injury, um, blogs, and uh, and different different ways that people are sharing their stories. Um, they also offer a really great um, core, online course called Brain Basics. It, it basically offers, um, in sort of lay terms, brain information, information about brain injury and recovery, and you can take that online. It's, it's really, really great. I encourage you also to um, take a look at that yourselves, but if you have clients or families who are looking for resources, um, this is also a, a, great, um, a great resource you can offer them. Um, I thought I'd share this because it's sort of an interesting way that perhaps clinicians are using technology to exchange uh, resources. I'm part of a, an online collaborative called Inswabi, and uh, it's the International Social Work Group for ABI. It was started by a social worker in Australia, and basically um, it's uh, an online community of social workers working specifically with brain injury uh, in hospitals and community. And uh, it's, it's been fantastic to be part of that. And I, I'm sure there's probably similar groups that exist for other professions as well. Um, uh, basically, we email each other. We ask questions. What are you doing uh, in, in your neck of the woods? How are you dealing with this issue? What are the resources that you're finding most helpful? Um, so really, there's, there's opportunities even beyond our direct client work to connect with other clinicians, expanding our professional boundaries. Um, okay, I have to use this thing. Okay. Okay, good. 
So how are people sort of jumping back to the cyber counseling? Um, some of you also may, may know a little bit about this already. What training is being offered here? Because it is a very specific type um, of counseling, a, a very specific modality of counseling. So are people just sort of picking this up and doing it? Um, no, uh, ho hopefully not. <laughs> there are specific training programs that exist out there. There's um, some great uh, courses that are available actually at U of T through the Faculty of Social Work. And Therapy Online is actually, uh, can, it's a Canadian group. They're in partnership with U of T. They've been around since about 1994, and they offer not only um, uh, linking individuals with counseling appointments online with a therapist, uh, but they also offer some great courses and uh, varying different, different levels um, uh, of cyber counseling and how that would operate in your own practice. Um, so that's a really great resource. And basically, I took a, I was trying to figure out how, how exactly does this work. Uh, so with Therapy Online, basically you contact them. They set you up with an encrypted email. They use privacy software, so you are emailing directly with your counselor. Uh, so the idea is that they write you back a therapeutic email based on what you've shared with them. Uh, so it's, it's certainly, from my experience, it's sort of... Um, it, it, it's interesting to think about what that would look like when we're, we're, most of us are used to doing practice directly with clients. What would it look like to um, perhaps use an email to respond, especially to perhaps more of the um, psychosocial issues that we, we encounter in our work? Um, and research. There's lots of research going on in this area. There's a lot of research on cyber counseling in particular. I just wanted to highlight one area because uh, I think it has some application perhaps for our work. Dr. Elsa Marziali is um, connected with the Rotman Research Institute at Baycrest. And uh, she's done some very, very interesting research with caregivers, not brain injury specifically, but caregivers who work with uh, older adults, um, and uh, living with individuals who may have chronic issues, um, uh, chronic pain, um, uh, brittle diabetics. So she's done some research in using online um, caregiver support and has, uh, has really kind of delved into this whole area. And it's been, there's been a lot of interesting results from that. Um, and one of the primary um, outcomes of her research is that the online support really reduces the isolation a lot of caregivers experience because they are, mo for the most part, at home. Uh, it's difficult to get away. It can be difficult to um, to leave the person you're you're caring for to go to a group. Uh, so so there's a lot of potential here to use um, use that kind of technology to support caregivers, especially. Okay. Moving along here. So some, some pros and cons. You've pro we've heard a little bit about this already. Um, in terms of the counseling and the online support, certainly it offers a lot of flexibility. Uh, for, for people who are living in more rural areas, there's uh, the convenience of it, the access. Um, it can be a good, again, good solution for people who are a little more isolated or uh, whom it's difficult to, to leave the home for individuals um, recovering from brain injury, sometimes transportation can be an issue. They may not be um, well enough or they may not have enough energy to leave. Um, so, so those are some potential um, pros to, to this sort of online world of support. Uh, for some, particularly with counseling, maybe it reduces the social stigma of, of going to a counseling appointment um, or the pressure of being face-to-face -face with someone. It really removes that whole dynamic. Uh, can give the individual a greater sense of control over the process. It's a little more self-directed. So in the case of an email uh, conversation with your counselor, you're basically sharing, um, you're sort of directing the, the work, uh, you're directing the, the conversation in many ways. And maybe also, um, I just as was shared earlier, the, the reduced cost, so the overhead of having an office space or, or travel time and, and uh, dollars that it takes to get to clients. This is another um, possible benefit. Some of the cons, so um, basically in terms of the online world, it's it's not always easy to know who's on the other end, so you certainly want to be very mindful of that. Um, 
as I was looking at some things online in preparation, I came across a really, uh, really funny sort of satire of online counseling. And it's, a, it's called Web Therapy. It stars Lisa Kudrow. It's hilarious. Uh, I should have maybe played a clip <laughs> this afternoon. Um, so basically, I would say this is what not to do. <laughs> this is what clinicians should not be doing with online counseling. She is a uh, Fiona Wallace, she's a counselor who gets sort of tired of dealing with other people's problems and she use, she develops the three minute video chat counseling session, which basically um, gives the, the client a little bit of time to talk about themselves, but mostly to help her problem solve her um, issues. <laughs> So you, <laughs> that's what you don't want to, to end up in. But anyway, it, it was pretty funny. So <laughs> you can check that out. Um, always concerns with anything online, with anything that you're posting. What is it confidential? What's the security like? Um, and in particular with um, counseling, sorry, um, certain issues may not be appropriate if somebody really needs um, direct um direct care for fairly significant mental health issues, the establishing an online um, counseling uh, setup that may not be so appropriate. Um, and one of the things that I, that I love about, uh, about the work I do is that you are face to face with someone. There's something very different about being face to face. You have those um, nonverbal cues that you certainly wouldn't see, um, certainly see if you, if you were sending emails or, or chat and that type of thing. Um, and I think just the, the importance of being with someone, being present with someone physically, that certainly adds a different dynamic. Um, potential for miscommunication, that was already talked about, especially in an email. I think we've all been there. You think, you know, what's the hidden message here? What are the, why are there so many exclamation marks? Why is that capitalized? Why didn't they do a smiley face? <laughs> you know, you kind of, you can think about how this might play into a professional relationship with a client. Uh, and then obvious things like technology glitches. What if the technology breaks down? What is your client's understanding of the technology you're asking them to use? Does some, some support need to be provided there? So certainly some things to consider. Um, but overall, it's opened up a lot of opportunities and I think it's great for us to, to think about how that expands our, our practice. Hello again. I'm going to try and move through this next piece uh, a little bit more quickly so we leave some time for David. Um, okay. So um, thinking about the benefits of social media. So as professionals, what should we be thinking about? And, uh, and I'm not up here to necessarily an answer the question, but more importantly to ask the questions for all of us to really start thinking about how are we using technology in our daily practice. So obviously the benefits, uh, we've heard a lot about them. Um, we can communicate with people all over at all hours at, you know, every day, all the time. Uh, and we're able to share information uh, much more easily and much more readily with the communities in which we're interested in. Uh, we're able to build community, promote research, and uh, share ideas and expertise. Uh, so modern day technologies continue to challenge and our, our professions we need to really be thinking critically about what are our personal and professional boundaries as it relates to our technology use. Um, Self-disclosure, I, I think as David pointed out at the beginning, um, there's a lot of information online about who we are now and you know I have a Facebook account I'm on LinkedIn I, I have all of that but I'm always really mindful about even if I'm only connected to my friends what am I putting out there and you know what potentially could people see and um, I think there's going to be a lot of money um, in the future for people doing consulting around how to manage people's um, um, online presence and identity because it is a lasting um, document that's not ever going to go away. Um, we need to be mindful of dual and multiple relationships, privacy and conflicts of interest. I think we all heard in the news this week about the iCloud being hacked. You know, this was a really sort of uh, protected thing where um, pictures of people got out there. So, you know, there is definitely an illusion that things are private, but uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed that when I'm on online and I'm on Facebook, I've started noticing the advertisements that are creeping into my Facebook account are actually things related to what I've been doing Google searches on. Uh, and someone actually told me the other day that they were doing um, a research for, uh, for a trip and that the cost kept going up and that depending on what kind of computer you were on, you might have seen some different prices. So the world is watching. 
Okay, so um, really thinking about what guidelines and policies do you have in place. Um, many of us are in private practice. A lot of us work solo. I think it's that much more difficult to really be mindful of these things. So what are you doing around email communications? Um, what are you doing about texting, telephone calls, voicemails, uh, friending requests on Facebook? I get them all the time. And I actually don't get them in person. I get them online. And then it's like, okay, next session, I've got to have this conversation. But this also brings up the point about really being mindful in advance and being proactive about how you're managing this kind of information uh, with your clients. So reducing the risk. Um, talk to your colleagues uh, about the various challenges uh, that social media bring uh, to us and engage in ongoing professional development that explores boundaries within your profession and allows for ongoing critical self-reflection. Uh, review college policies. They're out there, but you know, as technology is changing, you know, those policies uh, and those guidelines are going to be changing as well. And it's, it's almost moving too quickly for us to keep up with it. Um, document conversations that you have with clients pertaining to your social media policies. Um, inform them of your um, professional social media policy at the beginning of the relationship. So unlike me, who then has to go back, you know, to my client and say, well, I can't really be your friend. Uh, and explore your online identity regularly. I do it all the time, not really because I'm interested in myself, but I really just want to see, like, what are other people seeing about me out there? And I, I actually get surprised every now and again what shows up. So, um, and I'm not even sure what's going to happen when I see something show up that I don't want to be there, you know? So it's, it's, it's a little bit unsettling as well as we move into this, um, into the future. Uh, so in just starting David off, I'm just going to quickly review some of the statistics on cyberbullying. So the Kids Help Phone um, did a research study in 2007, uh, 2,474 teens aged 13 to 15, 70 percent of them had reported being bullied online, and 44 percent reported having bullied someone online at least once. They did a follow-up study in 2011, and it was revealed that cyberbullying behavior is now most rampant on social networking platforms, and additionally, young people abandon email in favor of phone-based text messaging, and text messaging now replaces email as the second most common platform for cyberbullying. Um, and then uh, cyberbullying behaviors among middle and high school students, a research study in 2010 uh, with 33 Toronto junior high and high schools surveyed, 49% essentially of students had been bullied uh, online. And in all three of the studies, the majority of the participants report that they did not tell anybody about the bullying. So it is a very significant problem um, that we need to further address. And I'm going to turn it over to David. So the context um, for considering cyberbullying here is, is not so much um, what we know about our children, children who, uh, or adolescents or adults who've um, not, who've avoided injury. My, my main concern in bringing this information to you is that we're dealing with professionally a population who are far more vulnerable than the majority of us to cyberbullying. Um, the degree of ignorance that children have about impairment, about injury, about brain injury, about changes to their friends and to other people in the classroom when they return provokes oftentimes ignorant responses as well. So um, the last thing anyone would want to, to, uh, to face from a rehabilitation provider's point of view would be having to spend a majority of your time dealing with the child uh, followed from receiving emails or um, uncomplimentary questions about uh, how they've changed, that kind of thing. So not to say that the um, Bill C-13, which has been um, put forward by the federal government for the purposes of slowing or stopping or punishing cyberbullying, am I bringing that information about it to you, but just basically so that if, if you find yourself in a situation where you are counseling a client who has suffered um, an injury and the family members are worried about their reintroduction to their friends, um, all the more important, I think, is to, to help them not only understand that it's going to be difficult for their friends to, to come to understand them as a new person, but that they are um, protected in many different ways uh, including, most importantly, you, for the fallout of, of, of the ignorance of their peers when they come to discuss their injuries and changes. 
apart from what that hap what happens in person, um, to Anne Marie's comments that many of the children who are within the uh, the uh, ABI program at Bloorview are in touch with their friends. We know that those friends are getting slightly different messages from the injured uh, client, the injured child or adolescent. Those messages may be more strident. Uh, they may be messages that aren't meant to be conveyed at all, but certainly there's a greater likelihood of miscommunication through texting, um, through Instagram, through other forms of communication in the children uh, who have suffered brain injury. So the responses are going to come, and uh, my, my expectation is you will tell me that you're spending a good bit of time in dealing with the social reintegration problems that your clients have, partly as a result of their exchanges, text, email, and otherwise with, with uh, their family members and uh, with other children. So cyberbullying not being directed to this population, I think it is definitely relevant. Where does it stand right now, Bill C-13? There were concerns by Amanda Todd's mother um, in relation to the degree to which the police would be able to keep, uh, obtain and, and keep the information which they found about any potential uh, breach of, of, of rights. And uh, obviously she's expressed that in the news and you probably read about it. In terms of the impact of texting, Facebook, all forms of social media on what I do on civil litigation, um, you will find that there are concerns as well um, in that courts will routine, routinely face motions by defense counsel and insurers for production of the online personality and that's a very significant uh, blow to um, people who are vulnerable themselves already in recovering from an injury when they find out that all of their exchanges have been shared with the, uh, the insurer or or therapists, and uh, they're facing questions about some of that content. So education, as, as Lynn and Anna Marie and Jessica have all mentioned to children about the impact of providing social uh, information, uh, be it by way of Facebook or Instagram, I, I think is extremely important. Um, I use the words a monitored and guided use of social media may help, so that means not only the, th the uh, therapy providers, but the family education is very important so that uh, there can be some consideration of, of uh, overview by family members about what's being put online and frankly what's coming back from, from friends um, to children. Because apart from it being a great tool, um, the electronic and social media, for people who may have physical impairments and certainly um, cognitive impairments in returning to their social sphere, when they have the opportunity to reach out, if they can't reach out physically, but reach out through the internet, uh, that's a very strong positive that hopes we all hope that augurs towards social reintegration, but the fallout can be doubly worse. Um, I have provided you just uh, some information for the use of uh, helping clients understand if they're being bullied um, and maybe that as a touchstone validates their concern about what, what they're receiving. Um, but obviously the definition of cyberbullying includes several different elements, insulting um, through false information being posted, um, singling someone out, identity <coughs> theft when you pretend to be someone else. Uh, the one that I think is probably most commonly breached by um, by by uh, persons who are are involved in uh, reviewing their friends' Facebook accounts and uh, and uh, interested in the photos there are if there is an image of a person in an embarrassing situation um, this is to the uploading uh, element of the defi definition if if you are uploading information you're sharing information about a person who is in an embarrassing situation without his or her permission um, then that also constitutes cyberbullying and excluding and harassment as well. So um, the law has not uh, been passed. C-16 is back before the House of Commons. C-13 is back before the House of, of Commons and we expect there will be continuing debate this fall and some form will be, will be passed. Just uh, another little piece in terms of those who are helping children return to schools and there is an online concern. You'll note um, the last bullet here the Ontario Safe, School, Safe Schools Act has made it a punishment for online behavior that's making hard for another student to return uh, to learn in a safe environment. So there will be a, an opportunity, I suppose, to 
uh, consider whether it's best to involve school officials if, um, if your client is, is suffering from, from uh, cyberbullying. Um, there are some remedies that I'm not going to go into right now. I think we're almost at uh, the end, so I think the message of the group is to reflect um, on your personal and professional use. Uh, certainly try to be proactive, understanding that um, because they're sleeping with their phones, the, uh, they're most apt to find some degree of social concern uh, in response to the emails that they, they send their friends, the texts they send, and the, the responses they get back, and uh, more than anything, uh, to, to help them to use social media responsibly. Thank you very much. Uh, we, uh, I think, are out of time for questions, but we'll be available for, uh, for any questions after the uh, day's events. Thank you.